Rob Part 2. Okay, thank you. Um, so last day we were, or I was just talking about the basic ideas uh, for calculating, uh, in fact, entanglement entropy in a quantum field theory. And so the, the basic problem that I thought, uh, or I said might be interesting, is that we'll study uh, entanglement in the following situation. First of all, we pick a Cauchy surface or a constant time slice. We want to break our system up into two pieces, and so we introduce some smooth boundary, or what I call the entangling surface, that breaks that Cauchy surface into two pieces, an inside and outside. We trace over degrees of freedom here in the outside. That leaves us with a density matrix describing what's left over on the inside. And then the goal was to calculate this entanglement entropy, just the usual von Neumann entropy of this reduced density matrix. And I talked a little bit about how um, one of the interesting features of that calculation is that you get this kind of area law expression where the first term um, depends on the area of our entangling surface. And then there's, we have to, to regulate the theory to make sense of this calculation. And so there's some short distance cutoff, delta. Um, to an appropriate power, which in my notation is d minus 2. And so d is the space-time dimension. Um, if that's, and, and I like to keep it a free parameter. We'll be working with d equals 2 later on in the talk. But uh, for all practical purposes, if you just want to remember where we live, we live in d equals 4, which means 3 space and 1 time. Um, and most of the talk was spent on actually talking about a quantum mechanical system, a system of coupled harmonic oscillators, which we keep in the back of our mind when we're thinking about doing this uh, field theory calculation. Just at the end of the talk, though, I mentioned that an unfortunate uh, feature of this uh, rather elegant term or elegant looking term is that this coefficient is going to depend on the choices that we make uh, to regulate the theory. So it contains not only information about our favorite quantum field theory that we're studying, but it also contains information about the choices we made to produce a finite result. And so if I did the calculation, if you did the calculation, we shouldn't necessarily expect to get the same number here. However, um, what I said is if we persist in this dot, 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 remember there's some kind of series expansion here, that if we go to high enough order that we'll actually be able to identify terms that carry some kind of universal information. And the example I gave was a term uh, that might go like a logarithm. And what I said is this coefficient is actually going to be independent of the details of our choice of regulator. And so this may tell us some, uh, well, information that characterizes uh, the quantum field theory that we're working with. And so the goal for today's lecture is to have an example of a calculation like that, where we identify this term and we see that it's actually some interesting or universal constant. Um, but before proceeding, then, I'll just ask if there were any questions about last day's uh, lecture. It's all perfectly clear. Excellent. No, it's certainly not. We talked, uh, well, it came up several times, I think, that, that, you know, a natural, I don't know if it's basis or set of Hilbert space that, spaces that uh, most people on HEPTH like to work with is the momentum basis. And, and those are the normal modes. And if we wanted to do a calculation where we integrate out normal modes, well, in the free field theory, we wouldn't get a mixed state. We wouldn't see any kind of entanglement. And so I just posited at the beginning of the calculation or at the beginning of the lecture that this is an interesting situation to consider. 
Uh, and so that's the problem I'm going to focus my attention on. People, if somebody else uh, has a different uh, preference, uh, he will get a different answer for enter. Uh, he would be studying a different problem. He'd get different answers. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, the focus on the black hole entropy, we already have the same answer, which is proportional to area. Well, that's one of the reasons why this was uh, this situation was first considered, and and we mentioned that because of this intriguing area law here, and and the connection perhaps to black holes. Uh, I'm not sure what specify the black hole in how a can different. We how, how, how about how about we talk about this after the lecture? It sounds like an intriguing direction, but but I have a lot of ground to cover today. So, uh. okay. So what were we going to do? Well, okay. So we have to look or I have to think a little bit more carefully about how we do these calculations, or how we might do a calculation like this. And so I wanted to talk about a particular strategy that people use. And it goes under the rubric of the replica trick. And the basic idea was that, uh, well, what I just erased here was the standard von Neumann entropy. That involved uh, a logarithm of the density matrix. Um, and well, logarithms are hard, and so a strategy is, instead of looking at logarithms, let's look at powers of the density matrix. And in particular, uh, there's a well-known entropy measure or entanglement measure known as the, uh, well, Rainy entropy, um, where what we do is calculate the log of the trace of some power of our favorite uh, density matrix. And so this uh, is, well, to Rainey in a way that I can't explain to you is a natural generalization of the von Neumann entropy. Um, but in, in setting this up, he didn't throw out uh, the baby with the bathwater. He set this constant here, um, which is singular in the limit n goes to 1, to achieve precisely that S1, or if I take the limit as n goes to 1, that this formula reproduces uh, the von Neumann entropy, or for us, what I'll call the entanglement entropy. Um, and uh, an alternate, uh, well, no, I, I, I'll just, OK. So what's the strategy going to be uh, here? Well, our strategy, n, n is an index. It's the same n that appears here. It's the power of the, the density matrix that I've got over here. Uh, this one? That's a 1. So I'm taking the limit n goes to 1, and I'm recovering the von Neumann entropy. Uh, so what's our strategy going to be? Well, we'll uh, evaluate. Sn for integer n, or actually what I'm going to focus on is evaluating this trace for integer n. Um, we're going to try to analytically continue to real n, something that sounds dangerous, but uh, we'll do it all the same. And then we'll take this limit of n goes to 1. Um, and I might mention that there's an alternate formula that's a uh, favorite. Rather than referring to Rainy entropies uh, on HEPTH, an alternate formula that people like to play with, which has the same effect of taking powers here and then focusing on the limit n goes to 1, uh, is that our entanglement entropy or our von Neumann entropy is equal to, where is it, the limit of n goes to 1. Here I take my trace, row a to the power n. But I take a derivative with respect to n, and I throw in a minus sign here. 
And again, you can play with that formula. And formally, what you'll see is that this limit produces the von Neumann entropy. Um, so how are we going to do this or accomplish this calculation? Um, and well, we could write it over here. So what is step A in the calculation? So we want to evaluate. Trace row A to the N. Step A is that we're going to analytically continue our calculations to Euclidean time. So this is a So this is a trick that Daniel told us about this morning. In fact, a lot of what I'm going to say here connects uh, very nicely to what Daniel said this morning. Um, and so formally, that's a trick that we often use in quantum field theory. And here, well, the reason I'm doing it becomes evident right away in step B, which is to evaluate the ground state wave functional with a path integral representation. So this is something that Daniel told us about this morning. So what I want to do is I want to think about um, well actually all I'm, I'm, I'm uh, what for those who, people who aren't happy with path integrals, um, there's some notes or, or a brief note and some references that I gave uh, somewhere on the web page. But basically, as Daniel said, what we're doing is just uh, Hamiltonian evolution, but rather than in real time, we're doing it in Euclidean time. And so we set some uh, more or less arbitrary boundary conditions down here at uh, Euclidean time equals minus infinity. And what survives at the end, or at t equals 0, is just the ground state. And so that there's some kind of, uh, in a field representation, there's some kind of functional then on field configurations on this time slice up here. Um, for us, we're doing a, uh, some kind of entanglement calculation. And so I want to cut that space into two pieces. And so I'll just, in my cartoon, call this region here A, and everything on the outside I'll call B. And so this functional then uh, becomes a functional of uh, the field, the configuration of the field in region A, and the configuration of the field in the outside. And so Daniel had labels uh, left and right uh, in his discussion. And in fact, we'll return to that. But again, basically what I'm doing is a Hamiltonian evolution, but in Euclidean time. So there's an e to the minus h, uh, whatever time period I have. And that tends to kill all of the excited states and leave us in the ground state uh, on this time slice. Um, I then uh, am going to just do the same calculation again. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in. from plus infinity, and what I'm going to get then is a conjugate wave function, like this. Um, and then what I want to do, step uh, C in my calculation, is or construct uh, the reduced density matrix. So I want to trace over the degrees of freedom in B in the outside. And so basically what I'm doing is I'm tracing over the field configurations in my path integral representation, where what we're doing is integrating over all field configurations. We had fixed boundary conditions on these two surfaces. But now what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, I'm going to integrate over those field configurations in the region B, or in the outside. And that'll leave me some, with something that's a function of the field configuration here at uh, t minus epsilon. 
and the field configuration again in the same A, but at T equals plus epsilon. So let's see where that is. So I, I'm writing something like phi A, phi A prime. These are the two arguments of my density uh, matrix. And I've traced over phi B of psi dagger naught. And I've used up the whole board. How about that? Um, so, so this is then, uh, formally what this cartoon represents is a path integral representation of this density matrix. What I'm doing is I'm going to integrate over two copy, well, over the entire Euclidean geometry, but I'm going to leave a slit here in the region A, and I get something that's a functional of the field configurations on the top and the bottom of the slit. Um, well, given that density functional, what I'm supposed to do is I, what I wanted to do, what the goal was, was to evaluate this trace. And so, um, well, to extend this formula here, I'm going to uh, evaluate So what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to pull out the colored chalk and impress you with artwork here, which I don't see happening, but we'll give it a try. Um, so what I want is I want n copies of the density matrix. This was one path integral for one density matrix. So what I need is a uh, few other copies. So here's copy two, so this is, okay, I apologize for the artwork, but this is supposed to be sitting in the background here, and then I'm going to also insert copy three. Oh, this is an ugly, oh, let's, where'd it go? Here it is. So there was this calculation that I did for row A, and then the blue and the green are just two copies of the same thing. So what I'm going to evaluate here is trace, trace rho cubed. And so formally that uh, equation is going to look like, well, trace rho A to the N. It's going to involve integrating over various uh, uh, the field configurations on these various surfaces, but I have to glue them together in the right way. So let's start with the first copy. I will connect uh, what I'll call phi 2. Well, here. I'll just write a formula. And the first one by one So again, the matrix multiplication is integrating over the fields and the corresponding slots here. So what have I done here? Well, I've connected uh, the one and the two density matrices, but what I'm doing is I'm connecting or identifying the field configurations on the top of the slit in my first density matrix with the field configurations on the bottom of the slit in the second one. Similarly, I do the same thing here. And then I'm supposed to connect, for the last one, I'm supposed to connect it back to row one and so, well, I guess I can go around this way. And so that, this picture then is representing what I've got in the formula here. So again, what this is, is some kind of uh, a cartoon picture, but what it represents is a path integral representation of this quantity up here. 
And so sometimes what we do is we write that out, or the, the answer that we found at the end of the day is that uh, we're evaluating a Euclidean path integral which again, the path integral was just a representation of uh, a particular way to represent the Hamiltonian evolution, but instead of sticking Hamiltonians in there, I'm integrating over all field configurations. Um, but I'm evaluating that path integral on an n-fold cover of uh, the original space. And sometimes what we do is we write this then as trace row, ah, row A to the N is equal to, um, and to represent that path integral that I talked about, uh, well, in the notation, or in the parlance of statistical mechanics, we borrow the words partition function. This is the partition function. The N means we're doing it on the N-fold cover. We're usually very sloppy in normalizing our path integrals. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a z1 to the power n. And I'm sticking that in there just to make sure that things are properly normalized, i.e., if n is equal to 1, then the trace here is just equal to 1. And so that's just a normalization factor that I put in there. So I should pause and ask, uh, was that clear what I'm trying to do here or represent with the poor artwork? Daniel's smiling. <laughs> okay. How do we actually carry out the calculation? Ah, well, that's the topic of the rest of the lecture. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, right, yeah, but remember... Uh, that wasn't the object that, taking the limit n of 1 here wasn't the object that I was interested in. I was either going to use this HEP formula or I was going to use the Rainy entropy, and so there's an extra singular factor. But, but we'll get back to that in just a moment. Did you have a question, or could we? Yeah, I mean, first, we have to calculate the state. We have to know right. The so, so again, what I'm doing is I'm doing calculation in the ground state. And so this, the starting point, that path integral on this half here was supposed to be evaluating a wave functional in the field space for the ground state. That's what the little zero here means. So implicitly, all of this is for the ground state. So, so I mean, the, six, uh, the picture for by the blue color. The blue. I, I, so I, I did this calculation in white, or I described in detail the calculation in white, where I built a density matrix, and then I'm just doing that same calculation in blue, and I'm doing the same calculation because in green. In space. Uh, no, it, it's just, here's copy one. <laughs> I'm putting copy two, copy three behind it. So, so they're completely independent path integrals. It, it's just my poor artwork. If, same, same. if I was allowed to give PowerPoint presentations, I have very nice pictures of that. But uh, same, same, same it's, it, the, this is all, again, time. These are completely independent geometries or backgrounds, completely independent path integrals. It's just, uh, well, some, I, I, it's just different copies of the same thing. Yeah. Anyway, oh, Patrick has a question. Yeah. Uh, see why we'd go to uh, taking the size zero dagger would involve uh, going to infinite time, but it looks like this is this is going to be going to infinite temperature rather than zero temperature for size zero dagger. Does that, does that make sense? Um, like e to the zero temperature. Well, is e that what you just said? Times the Hamiltonian. Yeah. Then I, if I want the ground state, I'm, you know, makes perfect sense that we take time to minus infinity. In the right. opposite direction, we get in, uh, we don't get in the ground state, we get the... No, that's temperature. zero temperature, because it's e to the beta h. Right. So this is still infinity. I'm just starting okay. another infinity away. And okay, good. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. 
there was someone in, if not, uh, okay, so, okay, so we have some kind of representation of this trace. Um, but that's not what the goal was. The goal was to evaluate the entanglement entropy. And so let me summarize then, just in words, the strategy to evaluate the entanglement entropy given that answer or given that construction over here. So to... So this is really the thing that I wanted. Um, so a schematic outline is, first of all, I'm going to, cons of, of describing this calculation is I'm going to construct uh, this n-fold cover. So that's this background with the n copies of the space, but there's a cut and, uh, well, in the, in the way that I described, uh, I evaluate partition function on that background, um, then what I said is we analytically continue. So I have a bunch of numbers now. I analytically continue that answer or the result. To real n, and then the last thing, I'm going to take that answer, or this now function of n, and I evaluate uh, the entanglement entropy, either using the Rainy entropies or using this uh, HEPTH formula, which I'm going to write out. Uh, I guess it doesn't really matter which. So I was supposed to take d by dn of this trace, but I'm now representing it by this collection of path integrals. So and so I can rewrite that as the limit as n goes to 1 of d by dn minus 1 acting on the log of Zn. So this is just this is just taking the previous formula I wrote down, replacing it by those partition functions, and then this is just manipulating that and rewriting it in a slightly different way, taking into account. So this is a strategy which I'll call uh, the condensed matter strategy in that it's customary on condmat. Uh, it's an approach that I think was first introduced there or, or largely championed by uh, Calabrese and Cardi, and it's become commonplace then in a lot of calculations. But this was a, uh, well, my course was a report on new developments in HEPTH, and so this isn't a new development, it's actually a very old development, but I wanted to tell you how on HEPTH we modify this calculation um, in a, in a sort of, to produce sort of a geometric approach to calculating the same quantity. And so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse these two steps here. And so I'm going to take out this and this. I'll write 2 prime. Yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The, yeah, the, uh, uh, the starting point in, in my discussion was that I pick a Cauchy slice or a time equals constant uh, slice. So I'm always, in, in what I'm doing, I'm always just talking about, yeah, at an instant of time. Yes. So, what I've learned is that there are specialists in the audience, but that wasn't new. But let me talk to the rest of you. Uh, and, and what I'm going to do is actually from Callan and Welchak, which I think their paper predates actually the paper that you quoted just by a month or so. Um, 
And so what they suggested is that instead, once I construct this background, I'm going to do the analytic little continuation to the geometry. So I analytically continue the geometry to real values of n. Given that new geometry, then I calculate uh, the partition function on this uh, geometry that's a continuous function of n. So, as I said, this is a, now, the focus is on the geometry here. Um, and if we think about, or what's the advantage of this approach? Um, the idea is that if I think about this uh, background that we constructed here, so it's some Euclidean background, but the entangling surface is some uh, submanifold in that uh, background. And if I try and go around the entangling surface, I keep running into the cut, or I keep going from one copy to the other copy. And so, in fact, I have to go around, if I'm just counting the angle that I go around, I'm going around an angle of 2 pi n, or uh, I have to go full circle n times before I get back to where I started. And so, the, uh, the entangling surface, um, well, the words I used is a co-dimension two surface. So all that means is it's, uh, it has two dimensions less than the full manifold, um, with uh, angular excess of 2 pi times n minus 1. So ordinarily, if I pick a random point in the manifold, I, if I go around, or if I, if I pick a line, if I go around, the angle's 2 pi. Here I go around 2 pi n, and so the excess is 2 pi n minus 1. However, at the end of the day, we're only really interested in this limit that n goes to 1. And so what this approach lets me do is it let me, lets me focus on n being very, very close to 1, and not really worrying about large... Uh, or geometries where there's a large uh, angular deficit or excess. So, That's an excellent question, which comes up in three lines. Uh, so, so the, uh, well, yeah, I'm just going to persist and say, so what this means is essentially, if I think just of the flat plane, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out a little wedge here of some angular width epsilon. But there's an issue then uh, in that how do I know what what geometry I'm really talking about. What wedge am I really supposed to cut out? And so this really is only guaranteed to work or produce a sensible answer if there's some kind of rotational symmetry around my entangling surface. And so... However, it has to be said that, uh, well, no, I'll skip that comment. But now there was an excellent question. Why is this a sensible thing to do? I'm not going to give you a rigorous uh, 
discussion about why this is a sensible thing to do, but I will go on a long aside now to provide some justification or some intuition why this is the right thing to do, uh, in part because it lets me talk about interesting ideas and things that I'll use later on, but also it makes some connection to what Daniel was talking about this morning. Um, you want n equals 1 plus epsilon because so you normally approach from n bigger than one side. I'm actually going to approach it from the bottom or, or below. Okay. It's just, uh, well, you could do either. It's easier to envision when talking about cutting out rather than putting in. Uh, that's all. So here we have an aside. The goal is to give some intuition or some uh, justification of this approach that I just uh, erased from the board. Um, so I'll start with some observations. For this audience, the first one is probably uh, unnecessary. But I just want to reassure the, the HEPTH fans that the density matrix uh, is just an, a, a bookkeeping device. And all these path integrals haven't uh, you know, changed anything uh, in the, in the uh, physics. So the comment is just that this reproduces the standard correlators. By which I mean that if I had some, uh, you know, field theory, I guess we talked about a free field theory and I was looking at correlators of the scalar field, we were working in the ground state. So let's say we're working in the vacuum the way it's usually defined. Um, all this is, this density matrix is doing is it's bookkeeping and it gives me precisely the same correlators when X and Y now live in A. And so in principle, there's less information here because I've, uh, here I had the global state. Here there's less information. Of course, using the usual technology that we use on HEPTH, it's easier to do this, just have the vacuum. And so this is a nuisance um, to, to use this bookkeeping. Um, the other comment is that in a relativistic theory, Well, as I described it so far, I had my Cauchy slice, and I picked my favorite region A here. And what I'm saying here is, or implying there, is that if I have two operators on that Cauchy slice inside the domain A, that's exactly what, uh, well, the bookkeeping that this particular density matrix uh, does for us. It tells us about those, or keeps track of those correlators. Um, in a relativistic theory, though, um, in fact, the density matrix doesn't just tell us about physics on that Cauchy slice, but in fact, it can tell us about physics um, in the entire causal domain or the causal development of that surface. And so the idea is, if I have some initial data here in A, um, well, information only propagates at the speed of light. And so given that information, I can actually tell you about uh, all of the physics inside uh, this particular little wedge. So this, this part of the causal development is all of the points that are uh, to the future of, of our Cauchy slice. But if I go backwards along any time like curve or null curve, then I'm just running into A. Uh, and similarly, if I wanted to propagate backwards in time, uh, I'd, I'd have another hat on the bottom. I should also say that, that I, I drew a circle here so that this is a nice cone. In general, if I have some funny region, what I end up with is I get null sheets coming up from the entangling surface, but you'll end up getting some caustics or ugly structure up at the top where uh, my causal development runs out. Um, OK, in relativistic theory, row A.
I'll just give that a funny name, Curly D. Is is that clear? Or I'm not sure how familiar or comfortable people are with that. Okay, uh, the next observation is Uh, no, sorry, I've gone back to, for, when I went to the aside, we're back at Minkowski just for a little while. We'll go, uh, we'll go back to the uh, Euclidean at the end of the aside uh, to make a connection with what I was talking about before. So basically, you went to Euclidean to basically do the calculation of complete containing entropy, and then you go to Lorentzian space. So. Once I've computed it, I have a number, yeah, and exactly. I give it to you. Exactly. Okay. But, but here, I'm just... I'm not doing any calculations. I'm just stating some interesting observations. And this is true. Well, implicitly here, I'm talking about the Minkowski signature uh, theory. Oh, OK. What is the formula? It's, it's the same formula. It's, it, it, which involves uh, a Zn, and it's just how do I evaluate Zn? Zn's a, a function of, it's just a, a number that's a function of this parameter n, and the question is how do I evaluate it? And, and so I'm evaluating it on, by doing a path integral on some geometry that also has a parameter n in it. Okay? Sure, those are the Raney entropies. So that's a, that's a quantity that... that Sorry, are you talking about Zn or Sn? Sn are the Raney entropies. So that's something that's not so common on HEPTH, but it's uh, our, our quantum information friends would... Yeah. Okay. Um, what did, uh, yeah, okay. Um, oh, yeah. The, so this is, I can think of this as a Hermitian uh, positive semi definite operator. And so what that means is I can re-express it, or I can express it, in terms of uh, some other operator, which I'll write as e to the minus h, where h is some other Hermitian operator. In my notation, just to get the norm, I mean, I could hide all of the normalization into some additive constant in h to make sure that the trace of this is 1. Uh, it's convenient sometimes just to make sure that the trace of this is 1. I'll add a normalization, an explicit normalization factor here. Um, but now I've only, I, I've only defined H up to some additive constant. But what is this new operator? It has a name. Uh, well, it has two names. So in the axiomatic field theory literature, it's something that is called the modular Hamiltonian. And in the, uh, it was rediscovered recently, or in the past five years, on the CONMAT uh, literature, where it's called the entanglement entropy, or the entanglement Hamiltonian. Um, and formally, uh, the, the folks who, well, in principle, it's, it's called a Hamiltonian uh, because formally what folks uh, in, uh, who, who were working in axiomatic quantum field theory did is they could think of a, an evolution with this Hamiltonian. And so you might implement that 
with some operator e to the minus, well, I'm going to put a wiggle in here so that I don't have to normalize, e to the i s, uh, or the exponential of minus i h, my, Hamil my modular Hamiltonian, times some parameter s. But what I'm doing there, then, is I'm taking some funny power of the density matrix. Um, and so, well, this is a useful tool, and one can prove theorems and, and properties of various density matrices or of, uh, of quantum field theories. But I have to stress the word here formally, because this is not a Hamiltonian like the Hamiltonians that we're used to. This is a Hamiltonian that, as I said, here is encoding all of the correlators, or this object is somehow encoding all of the information about all of the correlators in our region here. And so typically what I find is something that's non-local. And when I try, if I were to try and implement this flow or this evolution, it wouldn't be something uh, that's geometric. If I had a little wave packet and I was trying to evolve it forward, um, it would just suddenly spread out over the entire, well, over the entire uh, causal domain. Um, so these modular Hamiltonians are typically very scary beasts. Um, Uh, but I have to say, typically, because there are a very few examples where the modular Hamiltonian is explicitly known, and of course those are examples where uh, they simplify into some simple local expression, and where the flow generated in this way is a geometric flow. And so the most famous example where it's known is the Rindler wedge, which we saw this morning. So from my perspective, though, this is an entanglement calculation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to consider flat space. We're going to take whatever your favorite quantum field theory is. We'll consider the vacuum. Um, so using the Penrose diagram notation, of uh, Daniel, I'll use this to represent uh, Minkowski space. What I've done here, the reason I have a diamond rather than a triangle is I'm actually going to implement the conformal transformations that he talked about on X rather than on the radial direction. If you didn't like the Penrose diagram, this is the middle of Minkowski space. That's T equals X, or T equals zero, X equals zero and the space continues forever, and I need a bigger blackboard. Um, but what do I do uh, in an entanglement calculation? Well, I said the first thing I do is I pick a constant time slice. So let's pick t equals 0. And let's pick a simple entangling surface, which is just a flat wall, x equals 0. So this is sigma, then. That divides my time slice into two pieces. I'll call the left, is that the left? The left, the outside. So that's my, what I'm typically, or that's what I was calling B. I'll call the right, the inside. I said that uh, the, the density matrix that we calculate controls physics in the causal domain. And so in this case, there are just two light sheets, that one that goes up and one that goes down here. Uh, emanating from the entangling surface. Um, and so this is the region, well, these are the light cones that Daniel was talking about, and this is the Rindler wedge, uh, well, in the title here. I could also, Daniel continued those light cones this way and this way and talked about the, the um, Rindler decomposition, but for us, I'm just going to focus my attention here. Now, I can work hard uh, like Daniel did, or instead what I can do is I can quote 
an interesting theorem by some folks whose names I cannot pronounce. And so what they said is, we know what the Hamil the, this object is. The modular Hamiltonian in this particular problem is just the boost generator. So what is that? Well, we saw it this morning. It's going to be an integral over the slice t equals zero, but x greater than zero, we're only going to keep or it's only acting here in the right-hand side. And so we have to integrate over our other coordinates, which I'll call y. We'll integrate over the positive half of x. And then I'm going to write uh, x times t0, 0 for the advanced class. Um, this is just, well, that's the, z the, well, maybe it's the time time component of the stress energy tensor, but what is that? That's the energy density, or as Daniel called it, the Hamiltonian density. That's the thing that we would normally integrate over uh, space, all of space, uh, to produce the Hamiltonian, the standard Hamiltonian. Here we've got that same uh, density or those same operators, but we're weighting them, uh, or we're weighting their contribution here by the position, how far along this slice we are. And so what's this going to do? Well, it's going to push things farther up the farther out I get in the space. And in fact, I'm not, well, how far it's, or how hard it's pushing goes to zero at the center of the space. Um, what else to say about that? Uh, and, well, okay, what, what is this uh, modular flow? It's just the boost that Daniel talked about this morning. So, is a translation uh, ah. So, here's a modular Hamiltonian that takes a particularly simple form. It's just some integral of a local operator, and it produces a flow that's actually a geometric flow. It takes operators along these paths. T, I, it started as t subscript 0, 0, but then I called it time, time, or lowercase t, lowercase t. But, but the idea is that's just the, the thing that you would use to build the Hamiltonian. In a relativistic theory, the energy density comes in a uh, two-index two tensor, uh, and so I'm going to write an even more advanced formula in a moment uh, that uses that. But for our purpose, or you, well, if, you, if you're unhappy with the stress tensor, you can just think of it as the energy density or the Hamiltonian density. I, if I've not said that, uh, it's going to be said, yes, in so a little while. Do I know that my answer is... I, I, uh, I'm going... Uh, it, it's certainly true that I, I introduced some uh, bad singularity into the space-time. I did that way back when, when I was talking about this multiple cover. Um, and, and so you, you, you may worry about boundary conditions that you have to implement or, or how to implement the boundary conditions. Certainly you have to regulate the theory. Uh, but it, uh, as far as I know, the boundary conditions at the end of the day don't play a big role in the answer that you get. Uh, 
certainly in, in this game, I'm, I'm introducing a very tiny conical deficit, and I'm, I'm only looking at the leading response. And I know, uh, or other people have died for my sins, and, and the answer, that leading response is a universal response. Uh, but yeah, maybe if I didn't say that before, yeah, at some level what we're doing uh, with this callan Wilczek or this geometric approach is looking at the response to a tiny uh, conical defect. There is a guarantee that universal. I'm sure that uh, an unsupervised grad student could do it in a way to get it wrong, but if one is careful, uh, and the supervisor can just say, no, go back and do it again. Uh, the, the answer should be, there should be a universal answer, yeah, at the end of the day. Uh, yeah? Um, well, usually when I had dimension, so again, uh, another comment is this is, the units are, this is a dimensionless object. There are no units here, so Daniel would like that. But if I had a, if I was thinking, so this is the formula I wrote down, this is just some parameter, the F. If I, if I was doing standard uh, Euclidean evolution, or not even Euclid, Hamiltonian evolution, I'd have the real Hamiltonian, and I'd have the real time here, well, with a time-independent Hamiltonian. And so th this is in complete analogy with that. I, I, I'm not sure what sign you're worried about. No, no, no. Oh. It just seems that the, the energy kind of is... Uh, oh, this energy... the trying to get closer to the zero instead of being pushed out. If you just look at that one, the, 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 sign is the sign is correct. I'm not sure what your intuition is. So maybe... When I said pushing, I'm, I meant if I have an operator or an observer, or well, no, it's an operator, it's a quantum, then the standard evolution, if I just had that, if I took that X out, this would have been the, Hamil the usual Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. And so it would have taken me from the T equals zero slice up to some slice that looks like that. Now what I'm doing is I'm weighting that uh, evolution by an extra factor of x here. And in fact, I'm, I'm only considering part of the, uh, the right-hand side. And so now the evolution looks something like that. And so it's just to say, well, that, that, that these two, well, the, <laughs> the ordinary Hamiltonian and this Hamilton, or this object are different objects, and they, they evolve the system in a different way. And I was just saying that, uh, H here, the thing that pushes me forward or evolves me forward in the usual um, evolution is now being weighted by this extra factor of X. So points farther out from the entangling surface get more weight. So there's, there's, it's like there's more of a, I'm evolving faster out there. Um, Not lower dimension. Well, okay. I'm Just on the entangling surface, right? No. It doesn't lose a dimension. It didn't lose a dimension. No. Uh, oh, oh, oh. What you're thinking of maybe is the entanglement Hamiltonian. Right. Again, yeah. again, it does dimension. not. It does not lose a dimension. But in condensed matter, uh, or, or you know, in, in the typical uh, condensed matter uh, discussion, what you're concerned with are the boundary states. So the lowest energy or the lowest lying eigenvalues are the ones associated with boundary states at, at the entangling surface, if you like. But there's always, you know, if you look at the rest of the graph, there's all this garbage up there that you're not including or you're, you're ignoring. And, and that's really from bulk excitations. So, so, so this object really does act on the whole thing. It's just that in special systems, uh, there are extra soft modes associated with the boundary. Yeah, that's, so that was my intuition, actually. Oh. So there are modes that are not being pushed out anywhere. So where do they lie on those diagrams? <laughs> um, 
I'm going to take that. Uh, come afterwards, and we can talk more about it. Uh, what else did I want to say? So there's, um, uh, well, I guess I just wanted to make the comment. Well, it's really this comment. Um, so here I have uh, a modular Hamiltonian. Implicitly, here's the density matrix, and to, to what what these boosts are being transformed, or what these boosts are being implemented with in the quantum field theory, is some funny power of the density matrix. Um, and maybe we're just going to skip over stuff. Yeah. Oh dear. Yeah, go for it. Um, <laughs> so there is a theorem of uh, Dichmann and someone, right? Yeah. And what does it relate? Two, two Hamiltonians, two field theory, or one field theory? Two it field says theory? it sets up this problem here. Think about I'm doing relativistic quantum field theory. Here's flat space. I'm looking at the vacuum yes. of the theory in flat space. I'm, I'm uh, then building a mixed state by looking at t equals zero uh, at a constant time slice, and I'm throwing away half of the space or half of the degrees of freedom. I'm left with a density matrix over here. Yes. That density matrix can be described in this way. That object up there, that modular Hamiltonian, is this. That's the result. This, so we have the same quantum field theory. We're using it implicitly to build a density matrix. That density matrix then keeps track of the physics in the Rindler wedge or in that little piece of space time. Yeah? Yeah, he, uh, Daniel worked harder, but, but this is, if you like, I'll write any. So, so this is actually, this is that, this nice result is actually true. You can pick your favorite uh, quantum field theory and you'll get an answer, or this is the answer. It, it doesn't depend on uh, anything. Although, exp yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, So, since most of, or I, I don't know, how many people appreciate killing vectors? Oh, that's too many people. Enjoy them, of course. Uh, but unfortunately, I think I'm going to deny you. Uh, you feel free to ask me afterwards. There's, there, I, I'm just going to give the, the, the quick discussion I'll, I'll, I'll borrow that uh, Daniel had, which is to say that um, here I have these boosts. The boosts actually act in an interesting way on the space. Um, remember what I was talking about before was Euclidean path integrals. And so we have to go back to the Euclidean. Um, uh, So I guess I'm um, what happens is that these uh, booths become rotations. I, well, my Minkowski space just becomes, uh, if I analytically continue, just becomes empty R2. Uh, and the booths here become rotations. Um, Um, and this object, this same object, um, uh, 
Well, I still have the same density matrix. I have the same uh, uh, modular Hamiltonian. However, what I can do now is I can, in the Euclidean version of the problem, I'm, I'm going to use that to implement rotations around the origin. And so uh, Daniel drew this picture of, of going around in some angle theta. Um, and the point is just that, well, I'm, I'm still going to implement those transformations with some kind of operator, but basically all I'm doing is an analytic continuation of my parameter, and so this becomes something like uh, e to the minus h, uh, or is it minus h times, times now what I'll call my Euclidean parameter, but what is that? That's nothing but uh, my density matrix to some real power. But that's precisely the object that we were calculating or working with or that we encountered. at the beginning of the lecture. So the, the thing that what's in here is some power of, of the density matrix. And what I wanted to do was look at, uh, well, originally we were talking about integer powers of the density matrix, but then we wanted to analytically continue that parameter to some real parameter. And so we've got an object very much like this then. We've got rho to the a to some arbitrary real number, but what we've learned uh, and what killing vectors tell you even more elegantly is that that object is just generating rotations uh, through uh, the plane. Um, and so in our case, uh, what did we want to pick? Well, we wanted to pick, well, this the SE corresponds to N, corresponds to, we wanted to look at Ns that were close to 1, or they were just less than 1. And so what this is saying is that uh, the trace of rho A to the N is achieved by rotating by 2 pi to the 1 minus epsilon and identifying and so that's precisely what uh, this conical defect is doing if we take the partition function on a space with a small hole in it or cut out a wedge cut in it exactly what we're doing then is something that represents this rho to the s, and then we're making this identification, or that's gluing together the two sides of the wedge. And the two pi. The, uh, this is so, so the n, if n is 1, then that's a rotation of 2 pi. We, we, uh, we wanted to look at n is just less than 1, and so the angle that I'm rotating is just less than 2 pi. It's, this is just 2 pi n. Yeah. So now to the rest of the curve, I was thinking that the n is the size of your additional dimension. So it's adding the uh, continual, uh, an additional degree of freedom to the dimension of one direction, and n is an extent, a compact dimension. So that's an intriguing intuition, and I don't know what to make of it, so I have to ask you to come talk to me about it after, afterwards. Um, and the, well, okay, the nice thing that uh, killing vectors do is they, they would have let me write down a formula that obviously, gen well, generalizes this formula from Minkowski space to a general uh, situation, um, and it's then something that we can implement or we can recognize what the modular Hamiltonian is in any case where there's a symmetry uh, that leaves a certain surface uh, invariant. And so 
Uh, black holes are an example of that. Um, the sitter space is an example of that. Um, but I really, well, OK, I need more technology, more time to describe that. Uh, and rather, what I'm going to do is charge ahead. Um, this was the aside, though. And the conclusion here was to give us some kind of intuition that this funny geometric uh, idea of doing a partition function on a manifold with a small conical deficit was actually representing this trace rho to the n uh, in an appropriate way. Yeah? So this is good for uh, open boundaries or whenever we have a boundary with a finite size. Um, you, so, Well, that's a good way to make the segue. Then the nice thing about this is it's a, it's a technology or a result that applies for any field theory. Um, in general, you can't do this. Um, what I'm going to claim or show you, and then you'll have to come and ask me afterwards why it's working, uh, is by not looking at any old field theory. But what we're going to do now is we're going to focus our attention on conformal field theories. Um, and the goal here was, remember, way back at the beginning of the lecture, was find some uh, universal contribution uh, to the entanglement entropy in our field theory calculations. And so to do that, I'm going to pick a very particular example. And it's an example that has to do with uh, CFTs, or conformal field theories, uh, it's an example that actually generalizes to higher dimensions. But again, to keep things simple and uh, only run over by half an hour, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, two dimensions. Uh, now, I feel obligated just to say a few remarks on what is this strange uh, set of words. Actually, maybe I don't feel obligated. Does everybody know what a conformal field theory is? OK. Um, so, so, unfortunately, then I'll give some comments. Uh, but I will also refer the people who didn't raise their hands. You know, I can't teach uh, in the next 30 seconds what a conformal field theory is. But there are some pointers in uh, the notes that are on the web page. And they'll refer you to some other sources, some simple sources. You don't really, for what we're going to do, you don't really need to know what a conformal field, or all of the details of conformal field theory. Um, there's only really one or two tricks that we're going to use, uh, or properties of these uh, theories that we're going to use. But what, it, what, what is the intro, or what are the uh, remarks? So remember I set up this system of coupled uh, harmonic oscillators, and it turned into, in some limit, uh, a uh, quantum field theory, but in fact it was a very special quantum field theory in that it was a relativistic quantum field theory. And so that means that it's invariant under Lorentz transformations, which includes rotations and boosts. It's also invariant in flats. We were looking at it in just empty flat space, so it's invariant under translations, both in space and time. And so you put all of that together, it's called the Poincaré group. However, I think, as Daniel points out in his notes, there's a special symmetry that arises when the mass parameter, or what I call mu squared, goes to zero. In fact, there's an extra transformation that you can do, which is to scale the coordinates by some constant amount. Now, it turns out that it's a general, or it's believed to be a general result. It's, I guess, proven in two dimensions and almost proven in four dimensions. Uh, that if I have a relativistic field theory that has this global or constant uh, scaling property, then in fact that symmetry naturally extends to uh, a, a, a local or a position-dependent scaling symmetry. And so the thing that we call conformal transformations are coordinate transformations of a special kind.
where I'm going to think that I'm in uh, some general curved space time like Daniel was thinking about, or if, if you just want to work in flat space, this can be an A to AB. But the metric then, I do a coordinate transformation. It takes me to a new metric. But for these special uh, coordinate transformations, what happens is that that's equal to the old metric up to some overall factor where that factor may depend on the position in space and time. In fact, what I'm going to do in a moment is I'm not going to use this, but I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to let it transform to some other metric, some simple metric. Um, and what that's doing then is it's not using an invariance of the theory, but it's, it's using something where everything transforms, I might say, covariantly by which I just mean that basically I'm doing some kind of scaling. This is, a special, this is a special theory, and so everything transforms in a well-prescribed or a very simple way. Um, but it's really this local scaling invariance that's a special property of certain field theories which don't have any intrinsic uh, mass or any scales uh, in them. And so those are what are the conformal field theories. Um, another special property of conformal field theories is the following. I talked about the uh, stress tensor. So this was, again, we were talking about relativistic theories. This is just the generalization of the energy density. The energy density is hidden in this matrix. It's the TT component of this matrix. The off-diagonal components say the TI are momentum densities, and then the, the IJs or XY are stresses or pressures. Um, but in a relativistic theory, we combine them all together in this nice matrix. Usually it's the energy dense, or in a typical theory, uh, the energy density is, is sort of the dominant entry, but in relativistic theories, the other entries can also play an important role, and in particular, um, for CFTs, there's a special property because of that scaling invariance that I talked about. Um, it turns out that classically, at least, the trace of the stress tensor is equal to zero. So in flat space, what that means is that the energy density is equal to the sum of the other diagonal components, or it's equal to the pressures in this matrix. Um, however, in a quantum field theory, this may not always be true. Um, so there's something called the trace anomaly, which says that in the quantum theory, we don't quite preserve this property here but, in fact, if I take the uh, expectation value of this operator and I evaluate it now on some interesting curve geometry, what I'll get is uh, an answer that's non-vanishing. And it involves various curvatures or various uh, pieces of geometry uh, describing the space-time where I'm evaluating this, but then those are also multiplied by universal constants. So that's a general property that holds, uh, in fact, when the space-time dimension is even, and so d equals 2 is an example of that. Uh, when it's odd, it turns, when the space-time dimension is odd, it turns out there's nothing really with the right dimensions that I can stick here. And so it turns out that this side of the equation is still zero, uh, just like in the classical theory. Can you, uh, can you define uh, what's on the right-hand side? Uh, so let me give you an example. So for d equals 2, the formula looks like this. I have C over 24 pi uh, times something I'm calling R. So that's the Ricci scalar. Uh, so that's the thing that appears in the Einstein action, or it's the, the Riemann tensor with all its indices contracted. 
And C is the central charge that appears, uh, in, for example, in the two-point function of the stress tensor. So R would be some derivative of the... This is like second derivatives second derivative of, the, the of the metric. Uh, okay, and that's the only example that I'm going to use. So let's see if in the next five minutes I can calculate some entanglement entropy for you. Uh, was there a question? I beg your pardon? Uh, well, a free massless scalar field. That's a conformal field theory in any number of dimensions. A free massless, uh, oh, that's not quite true. You have to. How about the Isaac model? Yeah. <laughs> so you think of the Ising model as a field theory. Anyway, well, OK. Um, but but uh, a massless bo a massless fer you know, free massless fermion would be uh, the boson. I'm going to have to tweak it, and there's an exercise, or you can ask me afterwards how I tweak uh, the boson in, in a curved space time. Um, but there well there are, there are lots of other examples. N equals four super Yang Mills. Uh, we're going to hear about that later. Um, uh, but I wanted to do an entanglement entropy for here. Uh, so, let's see. Oh, an another comment, uh, well, okay. If you're done. Another comment here about that Ritchie scalar is if you know what the Euler character of is, it's a top, if I integrate R over any two-dimensional manifold, it gives me a topological invariant called yeah. the Euler character. Right. Yeah. So that's that's the same. Well, okay. So integrating this over all over the entire one plus one manifold will give me the Euler process. Yes. Yeah. Well, up up to a normalization. There's there's an extra factor of C. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to use that in a moment because I'm running out of time. Uh, so, what do we have? We have a D equals 2 CFT. Um, I'm going to put it for simplicity on uh, time across a circle. So it's on a big cylinder. Well, it, uh, it's, uh, my, my theory, the spatial slices are circles, and then they live in time. That's the R. Um, and for simplicity, I'll say that the circumference here is 2 pi r, 2 pi r. Um, so to calculate an entanglement entropy, the first thing I was supposed to do is pick a time slice. So we'll focus on t equals 0. Uh, that gives us just a single S1. And then I need to choose an entangling surface. Or what I want to do is I want to divide my S1 into two pieces. In general, I could, I could uh, that means I could pick some interval here. Um, but I'm going to pick a very special interval, again, because time is of the essence. And I'm going to pick something that basically divides this uh, circle in half. So this could be x equals 0, and this would be x equals 2 pi r. Or no, this would be x equals pi r. 2 pi r would bring me back. Um, So notice now that, that the entangling surface has two components. The, they're each just points, but it's the two points at opposite sides of the circle. Um, now, the, the first step in our calculation was we were supposed to go to the Euclidean, and so that makes this cylinder a Euclidean cylinder now. Uh, and then we were supposed to look and see that there was a rotational symmetry, but in fact there is no rotational symmetry in sight. However, we're working with a very special theory, and so I'm going to you take advantage of that. I'm going to take advantage of the property that uh, this theory has some extra scaling symmetry 
to build the symmetry into the problem. And so I'm going to make a vial, uh, or well, that's going to take my uh, cylinder and make it into a two-sphere. And so, since we all enjoy coordinates and coordinate transformations, this is a, there's a metric on my cylinder. Here's the Euclidean time. Here's the angle that runs around uh, the circle. Uh, the claim is that I do a coordinate transformation uh, that looks like that, and that what comes out then, if I, if I just do this coordinate transformation, stick it in there, that I can write the answer as uh, some new metric, which I'll write down in a moment, and an overall factor of sine squared theta, but what is that new metric here? So that's d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared, so hopefully that's something that we recognize as the metric on uh, a round sphere or a two sphere. And there's an overall R here which says that the radius or the effective radius of that two sphere is just given by the capital R. So now what I'm going to do, remember this, uh, these points in this coordinate system live at some funny place. They live at, on, on a slice called theta equal, they actually live on a slice called theta equals pi by two and then it would be phi equals zero and phi equals pi. But I'm just going to say that, you know, we can reorient the angles on our sphere so that those two points, which are at opposite sides of the sphere, are now the poles. Um, And so we know that there's a, well, there, if I'm thinking of the poles, there's, there's going to be a rotational symmetry. I, well, I didn't have to reorganize my angles. The geometry of the S2 is such that if I take two antipodal points, there's a rotational symmetry around them. Um, and so what I'm looking for is the response of my CFT to a small conical deficit at the pole. a formula. The formula was something like the entropy was, I'm going to, well this is slightly rewriting a formula I wrote down before. Now I'm using n is 1 minus epsilon and I'm taking epsilon to 0. There's a derivative with respect to epsilon. There's a 1. And then there was a logarithm and this is z at n so that's 1 uh, minus epsilon. However, the thing that I'm going to do now is, again, make use of the properties of conform. So I made use of properties of conformal field theory here by doing this rescaling, building a symmetry into the problem. Now I'm going to use uh, the fact that I've, I've created a problem or generated a problem with one scale in it, this capital R. And so I'm going to see how the theory responds to a change in scale like that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this formula and I'm going to drop the limit, well, right limit here. Uh, I'm going to have my derivatives. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this act on my partition function. So this is a, what I'm doing is I'm 
basically just expanding the sphere by, with that derivative by a little bit. And this is for a normalization uh, so that I have a dimensionless quantity here. Um, it turns out that acting with a change in scale, well, yeah, well, making a, a change in scale like this, acting on my partition function, what that does is basically uh, bring down the trace of the stress tensor into the path integral. And so the claim is that what this turns into is an integral over my two-sphere of this, well, I'm a, of the trace of the stress tensor, and I'm, it's in the path integral here, so I'm evaluating the expectation value. And so that's the thing that we said before was c over 24, 24 pi times the, the Ricci curvature. Now, I could go through and what one can do is carefully describe how, well, most of the sphere is just round and so there's a constant contribution coming from most of it. There are two delta function contributions coming from the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole. Um, when, I, when I have my epsilon non-vanishing, and then you can go through and carefully evaluate this integral here, um, taking a, sorry? Uh, epsilon is hidden here, and, and so epsilon is, uh, it, no, it's not in the stress tensor. It's in the geometry. I, I said this was the two sphere, but it's really a two. It's really a football shape. I've taken a little tiny wedge out of the two sphere, and so what I'm integrating over here before I take the limit is really a football shape. And and again, it's a football shape here. So I I, I don't have any good notation for you, but that's where it's hiding. That's American football. Uh, okay, that is you're. <laughs> I stand corrected. There's, so there's an American football shape here and an American football shape. Okay. Um, and, oh, and the point was I could go through and do that all very carefully, but I made this remark before that this is actually a topological invariant, and this American football is just a sphere. And so once you add all the pieces together and do it all very carefully, you just get a number that in fact is independent of epsilon. There is no epsilon left over because that's the Euler character. And so you just, this integral just gives you a four pi as though it was the integral over the, uh, the no, well, okay. There was a four pi, yeah, anyway. You get a simple number that comes out. And so I'm gonna skip ahead. Question. Yeah. Uh, it's two dimensional, is that just the Gaussian curvature? It is the Gaussian curvature, yeah. Uh, although it may be normalized slightly, there's a factor of two there's a, okay, there's a factor of two difference, I'm told. Yeah, I mean, uh, there goes my chuck. Yeah, for, for this sphere, uh, if, if I, t no, locally on this sphere, that evaluates to two over capital R squared. No, 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 what I said, okay, what I said very quickly is that there are two contributions. There's sort of the round part, and that's just this 2 over capital R squared. Then there are two delta function contributions, and so that integral includes both of them. And the derivatives, uh, when you take the derivative of R? Well, I'm going to do that just in a moment. It, I mean, it, that R acts everywhere it sees an R. But I'm going to try and get you to coffee in a few minutes. Uh, so I'm just going to get a number. Uh, and so I can plug that in there. And what do I have? Sorry? Uh, okay, thank you. No, there's an R squared in the measure. 
got one of them right. Uh, what was I doing? Uh, okay. S equals C over 24 pi. 8 pi equals C over 3. Or what I can do is I... Uh, yeah, I'll do that. Sorry. I'll just divide... And now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to integrate uh, over R. And so I'm going to integrate up to spheres of size capital R, which are the ones we had over here, and I have to regulate the bottom end, and so the convention is that I'm just going to stick my short distance cutoff in there. And so what we end up with is an interesting formula that looks like that. Um, and so what we see is I calculated the entangle, this again is the entanglement entropy, I came up with a logarithm here, uh, which is the kind of term that I suggested we might identify, but this coefficient here is a coefficient that we recognize, or that we may recognize. Uh, it's a coefficient, or it, it carries interesting information about the theory. It tells us what the central charge is. And so this is an example, then, of a uh, calculation where I've, I've evaluated a universal uh, contribution to the entanglement entropy. Some more comments are that uh, this is really the, the, I mean, one of the reasons that it's simple to go after two dimensions is if you remember in my formula, there was a delta to the d minus 2. Um, and so, well, when that, D minus, when that exponent is a zero, what it really means is I should replace that power law divergence by a logarithmic divergence. And so this really is the leading, the, the log really is the leading area law or effectively the area law contribution when I go to D equals two. Um, you can carry out similar calculations, though, in higher dimensions. Um, and in fact, if you carried out this same dimension, what you would get is something that looks like this. SEE -E equals blah, blah, blah. And you wouldn't see the power laws. And so you might ask, where did the power law divergences go? Well, it happens that in this calculation, when I evaluate the, well, I would at some point be evaluating the expectation value of the, uh, the trace of the stress tensor. In fact, when I evaluate that, I've already renormalized the theory. I've thrown away a lot of, or, or I've absorbed, or, or yeah, thrown away uh, a lot of uh, divergences in this expression. And so what people usually write down is, is a renormalized or a finite expectation value. And so as a result of that, it turns out that that choice of renormalization or, or going through this approach uh, only lets you see the logarithm here. Uh, more interestingly, perhaps, uh, I, 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 I took an entangling surface that divided the uh, result or the space into two dimensions, uh, you could repeat uh, the calculation with an arbitrary interval. Um, the thing that I have to do uh, as an intermediate step is I have to do an extra conformal transform or the simple if I have, yeah, an extra step I have to do is an extra conformal transformation that pushes my uh, entangling surface out to the pole so that I have this symmetry that I can work with uh, in this approach. But I'll just write the answer down that you would get. Uh, 
and there's an extra sine theta where theta is the angular or half the angular width. Well, here, I'll just call that two theta. If this was my circle and I chose this as my region A between those two points there. Um, and then there's an interesting discussion about conformal killing vectors, but I didn't talk about killing vectors, so I won't talk about conformal killing vectors. Uh, and I'll just uh, stop there. Yes? Right. I yeah, I'm not actually sure. Someone else was asking me about uh, how to do these calculations for uh, a chiral theory. Okay. Yeah. The sum of the absolute value. Yeah. So, so, so in this calculation of the entanglement entropy of the half circles, you seem to have done like things exactly, but I mean the exact answer has some signs in it, right? Sign of R over the total length. No, no. I chose a special configuration where the signs are just one. This is the this is the answer you're thinking of here. I mean, I can write. Actually, I probably can't. But uh, let me try. The, the formula you're used to is one that looks like uh, C over 3 times the log of C over pi delta times the sine of pi times the physical length over, uh, sorry, where this I'll give that a hat or a funny squiggle. That C is the 2 pi r, the circumference of the circle. But that, that sign is just this sign here. Oh, uh, it's just that this is, if I stick a 4 pi in here, this is what I would call the Euler density. I'm, I'm integrating it over something that's topologically a sphere, and so I get a 2. But this is an example. I've deformed the sphere away from the round sphere, but I still, even when I take into account, uh, you know, the delta functions and the epsilons, you still get this answer here. So it's showing that it's a topological invariant uh, for a two-dimensional manifold. Um, there's, yeah. I, it, 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 yeah, that was something that lost, got lost. But, but there, in, uh, the short answer is yes, but if you want to come ask me afterwards, I can show you some formulas. I'm, it's, I'm over, that's all. Sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> 